questions? Okay, so let me then begin. So I'll first write down the question that we wanted to answer. And this is the following that suppose a field psi, psi transforms in some m dimensional representation of a series. psi has m components. So psi transforms to <coughs> r of u times psi where r is some, SU, some representation. So r is some m by n matrix. And I'll take this to be unitary representation. So I'll also take this to be unitary. Now the question is, what is what is d mu psi such that d mu psi goes to u of a function psi? Okay, u I should have said is a function of x. Okay, so this is the question you want to answer. R of U. Before we try to address this question, let's just try to recall a two things about group theory. This will be some review of SUN group. So an infinitesimal element element has a form of one minus i epsilon p but p is a Hermitian matrix so p dagger is p and hence p can be written as some linear combination of omega IP. Okay, this is the linearly independent basis of Hermitian matrices. So you have to calculate R of 1 minus I epsilon P. Now, we know that R of 1 or R of identity is identity matrix. Okay. So if we take something that is close to the identity matrix, okay, it better be close to the identity matrix. Right? Uh, the representation of this should be close to the identity matrix. So this should be 1. So this was n by n. This should be 1, which is m by n. It's close to the identity matrix, so I'll write this as minus i epsilon r of t. So r a of t. So this is what defines r a. Is this clear? Okay, this a will stand for algebra, okay, but this is the definition of what r a of t means. Given any generator, Construct an infinitesimal element, which is 1 minus i epsilon t. Take its representation. Okay, we know that it should be close to identity. So it must be of the form identity times something infinitesimal. Okay, whatever it is, I am calling it minus i epsilon r a of t. 
Okay? And from the fact that R of u is unitary, Unitary, it follows. Okay, so this implies that R of R A of T is Hamiltonian. Okay, the proof is identical to the proof that T is Hamiltonian. So what we want to do first is to express, we want to express R A of T in terms of R A of T. So okay, for every generator we know what it represents in that this is what it defined, what it defines it. Okay. Now the question is, can we write R A of T in terms of R A of T X? Okay, individual. So these are finite number of matrices, right? N square minus one matrices. So can we express R A of T in terms of those N square minus one matrices? So we can take that R A will take any unit, uh, any Hermitian matrix. No, no, not any Hermitian matrix. Because if you have an m, m dimensional representation, right, the number of linearly independent m by a permission matrices is m square minus 1, right? Typically, if m is larger than n, then there are more Hermitian matrices. So you are not going to take any Hermitian matrix. Because if you take any Hermitian matrix, if you take a basis of all Hermitian matrices, then obviously this being Hermitian can be re expressed in terms of a linear combination of those m square minus 1 Hermitian matrices, right? But you want to see if we can express it as a combination of n square minus 1 matrices, R A of T. Uh, what I was trying to say is that whatever sits in the argument of R A, yes. suppose that is Hermitian, then R A T is guaranteed to be Hermitian. No, we don't know. Because we don't even know how to define R A okay. for anything other than T, which is a generator, right? I mean, that is not, that is not defined, right? Well, okay, so you are asking, you know, so maybe I made a mistake. So if T is Hermitian, so T is n, n by n matrix, okay? So if T is Hermitian, then by construction, this is Hermitian, this is unitary. If T is Hermitian, this is unitary, right? Okay. Then we define R of this, which is unitary by definite, by assumption, right? And this being unitary, you implies that R of T is Hermitian, right? So it's clear that if T is Hermitian, if T is a linear combination of the generators of SUN, then R A of T should be Hermitian, right? But not every Hermitian matrix can be of the form R A of T. Okay. So this is a question you want to ask. We want to express R A of T in terms of R A of T. Okay, and let's see if we can do this. So for now, we switch off, switch off summation convention. Okay, so eventually we will switch it on, but I will tell you when we have to go back to summation convention. Okay, for right now, let's simply forget about the fact that we are using summation convention. So now, we calculate R of 1 minus I epsilon T. On the one hand, this is given by 1 minus I epsilon R A of T. That is the definition of R A of T. On the other hand, if T 
is given by this. And then this is R of 1 minus I epsilon sum over A omega A B A. So okay, that's the expansion of P. This I can write as R of product over A 1 minus I epsilon omega A B A. Because there are order epsilon square terms which are ignoring. Okay, plus order epsilon square terms which are not doing that. This is okay. Okay, if we take the product, we just get this. But now you use the fact that R is a representation. So representation of a product is the product of the representation. Right? Representation R of U1, U2, U3, etc. is R of U1 times R of U2 times R of U3. So this I can write as product over A. R of 1 minus I epsilon omega at A. Is clear? But this by definition is 1 minus I epsilon omega A. Okay, we just think of epsilon omega a. See, this is not sum. Okay, every individual uh, we are doing it for every individual a. Okay, so think of epsilon omega as an infinitesimal parameter, and use this definition. Okay, with epsilon replaced by epsilon omega a, and p replaced by p a. Okay, then suffix is a. Here. But this I can write <coughs> as 1 minus I epsilon sum over A plus R epsilon. So now we compare this with this to order epsilon and what we learn is that R A of P sum over A omega A R A of P A or R A of sum over A omega A P A sum over A. So the fact that R has group property, right, that R is a representation of the group, that R of U1 times R of U2 is R of U1 U2, okay, translates to the generators as R being a linear map. Okay, if we take a linear combination of generators, okay, R A of that is the linear combination of R A of the generators. Okay, that's what this is saying. Is this clear? Okay, so this is an important property of this representation of the algebra that will uh, need once in a while. Exactly. So it's because of the group property. Well, not the group property of the U. But it's the fact that the R of R was a representation, right? So that when you take product of two U's, okay, R of that is the same as R of U one times R of U two. Okay. That is what is being translated to this property, okay, which we find for the generators. Well, you see, this is what we have used. Right? The crucial step that we have used here. These are, of course, all definitions. Okay? But the crucial step is that I could exchange this product over A with the representation. Right? 
Representation of a product is the product of the representation. Right? That's what we use and that's what led to this formula over here. Okay, so from now on we again restore summation problem. Okay, so now I'll prove two more properties. Okay, and then we'll be ready to uh, uh, define our review. So, first property, okay, the first property is this is just a statement. We know, we have seen already that if PA is Hermitian, is Hermitian. Is also a generator of S U N. Okay, it's not hard to see, right? U T A U inverse is nothing but U T A U dagger. So you take a Hermitian conjugate of this, you just get back U T A U dagger. So if T A is a generator, so is U T A U inverse. Okay, so we can define R A of both. Okay, so you can define R A of U T A U inverse. It makes sense because it's a Hermitian matrix. N by a Hermitian matrix, which must be a linear combination of the uh, generators. Right? So R of this makes sense, right? Because it's an S U N matrix. Is this clear? Yeah. So like, so all of the TAs, yes. you can change bases into some other TAs, but there will still be a like Hermitian, exactly. And generators. And generators for the yes, so they will still be generators. Yes, right. I mean, actually, I can just remove this A, okay. Take any T, okay. Take any T, which is a Hermitian matrix for any n by n Hermitian matrix, right? One minus i epsilon T is a group element, S U N group element, right? That's what defines S U N. So then, array of that matrix makes sense. Right? Because array of 1 minus i epsilon t, so how will you define array? So array of 1 minus i epsilon t, sorry, r of 1 minus i epsilon t by definition is 1 minus i epsilon array of t. Okay. So this definition tells you what array of t is for any Hermitian n by n matrix. Right? So since T is Hermitian, I can I have definition of R A of T. Since this is Hermitian, U T U dagger is Hermitian. Okay, I have a definition of R A of U T U dagger. Okay, because any Hermitian matrix can be used to generate any principal S U N transforms. Okay, so let's say R A of U T U. Yes, Hermitian and traceless. Although in this case, Hermitian traceless. In this case, if the tracelessness property is not really necessary, but since you are doing S U N, let's put this traceless this condition. Okay, so if you take R of one minus I epsilon T. Okay, sorry, this is just a definition. So let me make the statement. 
So the first thing we should, I want to emphasize that this is something that makes sense, right? U T U in U dagger is a Hermitian matrix. Okay. So I can say certainly define what area of that is, right? By yeah. because for any Hermitian matrix, we know what area of that. Any n by n Hermitian matrix. Okay. So this is something which is defined from the uh, 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 definition that I have given. The claim is, claim is that this is given by R of group, R A of T, R of U. Is this claim clear? Okay, you are saying that if we take U to U inverse, take its representation in the algebra, this is an element of the algebra, take its representation in the algebra, that will be given by this matrix over here. These are all M by M matrices. Okay, so I'll now give the proof of this. Okay, but before I give the proof, at least what it claims should be clear. Okay, this is a relationship between two m by m matrices, okay? u t u inverse was an n by n matrix, but r of that is an m by m matrix. Similarly here, r of u is an m by m matrix, r a of t is m by m, this is m by m, so this is a relationship between two m by m matrices. Okay, and the question is how do we prove this? So the proof goes as follows. So the proof goes by taking r of u, 1 minus i epsilon t u inverse. These are now all group elements. Okay, so let's say I have written R here. Okay, this is of course an SUN group element, this is an SUN group element, this is also an SUN group element. So on the one hand, this is given by R of 1. I am evaluating the uh, thing inside. 1 minus i epsilon, i epsilon, u t u inverse. That I have expanded this out. Okay. But this by definition is 1 minus i epsilon, i of u t u inverse. This is the definition of R e of u t u inverse. Okay? That the group representation of 1 minus i epsilon times any generator, any Hermitian matrix, is given by 1 minus i epsilon times R e of that Hermitian matrix. But on the other hand, I can evaluate this okay, using the fact that the R has group property, okay, that R is a representation. I can write this as R of u, 1 minus i epsilon by R. Right one more step R of 1 minus i epsilon t R of u inverse. Okay. This is given by R of u. Now this is infinitesimal. Okay. So this I can write as 1 minus i epsilon r a of u r of u inverse okay so this is identity the r of u times r of u inverse this identity minus i epsilon r of u r a of u r of u inverse <coughs> Yes, that's again the property of the representation, right? That R of U1 times U2 is R of U1 times R of U2. From that it follows that R of U inverse is R of so R of U1 U2 is R of U1 times R of U2, right? Okay. So now take U2 equal to U1 inverse. Okay. So R of U1 times U1 inverse is given by R of U1 times R of U1 inverse. Right? This is 
is identity r of identity right r of identity is identity right so this is identity so that says that r of u1 inverse so this implies that r of u1 inverse is the inverse of this matrix right that's r of u1 Okay, so that's what we are using. So it's not an independent statement. Right? It just follows from the fact that R is a representation and the fact that uh, identity maps to identity in any representation. So now we just compare these two. Right? It's the same starting point. We have just manipulated two different tools to arrive at these two different expressions. And that's what gives you this relation over here. R of U G U inverse is R U R A of T R U inverse. Is this clear? So we are trying to see whether we the original relation that we had for no representation, where they are produced using this representation, then Okay, we'll see that once we have these identities, uh, the another identity I have to write. Then the, uh, the I'll define the mutual, and it will be easy to check that that the mutual is really a covariant element. And you don't need to use any other fields. Yeah, exactly. We will use original gauge fields okay. to um, construct our mutual. Okay, last time I wrote down the result. Okay, but this time we'll see why it works. Okay, the second relation is the following. Then if u of x is an SUN matrix, okay, this symbol means that if it's an SUN matrix, then I del u u u inverse which is also the same and I del u u u data This is Hermitian and Testless. Okay, in fact, we had proven this earlier. Do you remember the proof? Right? This is the, the Hermitian is easy to check, right? Just take a dagger, it becomes U del mu U dagger, right? And then you fact that use the fact that U dagger is identity to transfer the derivative to the other side. This lesson this is also uh, not hard to check. Okay, so suppose this is true. Okay, so I del mu u r u inverse is Hermitian traceless matrix. So it makes sense to construct R a of I del mu u inverse, which will be an m by m matrix. You want to write an expression for this in terms of RA of U. So any guess what it should be? Yes, I del mu. of RA of R of U. When you refer to u, it has to be r, right? It's a representation of the group now. Okay, r of u times r of u inverse. There is an r on that side. Yes, there is an r on that side, which is true. So this is a representation of the algebra, right? 
this one is constructed from the group elements, right? But this should have the property that this is also a representation of the algebra. Okay, so this is a matrix relation. Relation between two M by M matrices. Is this statement clear? Okay, so we'll now see how to prove this. So to prove this, okay, it's useful to multiply both sides by delta x mu. Okay, where delta x mu is some arbitrary if it's some variation, and then uh, prove. If, if you can prove that this is true for arbitrary delta x mu, <coughs> then you have proven the original relation, right? Because delta x mu can be taken completely. So this now becomes left hand side delta x mu I can take inside because it's linear using the fact that R A acts linearly right? I can take delta x mu inside okay? so this is R A of I delta x mu del mu dx and c x inverse. So this is R A of I u of x plus delta x minus times u of x inverse minus 1 times u of x inverse. Is this clear? Minus u of x. Sorry, minus u of x. Thank you. This becomes R A of I minus I I have taken outside. Okay. I is an overall multiplicative factor, right? I is an overall multiplicative factor. Right? I have taken this outside. So u of x plus delta x times u x inverse minus u x times u x inverse is identical. Now let's do this. Let me see. I'm just trying to see what is the simplest way to arrive at this. X plus delta x u of x inverse. This we know is this is just a product of two group elements. So this could be R of u x plus delta x 
times r of u of x inverse right so this is delta x mu del mu so this i can write as u u of x r of u of x plus delta x mu So this is R of U of X times R of U X inverse identity plus delta X mu del mu R of U of X inverse sorry R of U of X R of Okay, R of u x plus delta x u x inverse I got to this point. So this is we say already you have got something appears on the right hand side. Okay, multiplied by delta x mu, or that is basically what appears on the right hand side. This one. Okay. So somehow we have to match this with what appears on the on this side. Mm -hmm. That was not necessary, so let's see if we can get there. Easier. So use the fact, so now we start from here and go in a uh, different direction. So we write this as r of u of x plus delta x mu and del mu u of x times u of x inverse. Right? I mean the same expression I'm now Manipulating in a slightly different way by manipulating what is inside. So this is given by R. Now I say E of x, U of x inverse gives you identity. Identity plus delta x mu, del mu, E of x, E of x inverse. Now we just multiply i and minus i okay, because this is the Hermitian generator, right? i times del mu u inverse is like a t. Okay, so using that I can now write this as 1 identity minus i delta x mu r a of del mu u x, i del mu u x, u x inverse. Okay, so in fact the first part of the analysis was not necessary. So it's actually going in the opposite direction. So now we'll compare these two. So the coefficients of delta x mu would cancel 
and what we will see is that to compare this Ra of i gives you e of x e of x inverse is if minus i goes there and becomes plus i so i gives you r of e of x Mind that the group property of R is crucial, okay? Because we made use of this relation. Okay, that's why we take a product of the use. Okay, that is the product of the representation. Okay, that was the crucial relation that establishes identity. Sir, in this step, it is uh, this one. Okay. Yeah, I just tailored expanded this. So this is a function R of U of X is a function of X. Right? So I just tailored expanded this in bars of X. In bars of delta X. So first term is R of U of X. R of U of X. Because I'm setting I am not tailor expanding in U. I'm tailor expanding in delta X. Right? So R of U of X, that's the first term. Right? The second term will be delta X mu times del del x mu of whatever it is, r of u of x, right? that's this term, okay, times r of u of x inverse. <coughs> so, as r is one type of mapping, so we can use the Taylor expansion for r. Pardon? As r is one type of mapping from uh, n for n. Yeah, so r is a mapping from x place to uh, the matrix space, right? Mm -hmm. It's an m by m matrix called function of x, right? Mm -hmm. So, each element of the matrix is just an ordinary function of x. So you can tell it expand, right? Each element of the matrix. So you think of this as R of U of X, right? Is being a matrix whose elements depend on X, right? And tailor expanding just means that you take each element and expand it out in parts of delta X, right? So when I say del mu of this, right? What does it mean? It means that take the matrix R of U of X, okay? Each element is a function of X. Okay? Take the derivative of that with respect to X, right? That's what this matrix is. Doing. That's clear? Right? So you tailor, tailor expanding a matrix basically means tailor expanding each coefficient of the matrix. Right? Because you're not differentiating with respect to a matrix, right? What you are differentiating with, with respect to are just ordinary numbers. Right? The x's. Right? So tailor expanding in argument which is a matrix, of course, is uh, not well defined. Right? But tailor expanding a matrix in which is a function of ordinary variables, right? That simply means that you will tailor expand each element. Other questions? Okay. So we are going to use these two identities that we just derived okay, to prove that the covariant derivative that we had written down last time actually transforms covariant. So now the claim is that if we define B mu psi as del mu psi minus i B mu a r e t a on psi. Then transforms as B mu prime 
my time and he will bet. Prime means transform. Sorry, R of two. Thank you. Is this claim clear? Right? That what you have to do is that you take d mu psi that I have defined here. Substitute for psi as psi prime, which is u of x times psi, and for b mu, b mu prime. Okay, the transformation law that I wrote down earlier. And then you have to prove this relation. So we'll find it simpler to use not b mu as such, but s mu. So let me remind you that what s mu was. Recall s mu was a matrix, okay, n by n matrix. Defined as sum over A, B mu A of X mu. Okay, N by N Hermitian matrix. Okay, B mu A are real fields. Okay, N by N Hermitian matrix. Capital M will be determined by the number of size. Yes, capital M will be determined by the number of size. Exactly. Right? So it's a M-dimensional representation. Right? So I mean, number of size does not necessarily fix size the representation uniquely. Right? Because SU2, for example, if you take a three-dimensional representation, right? It could be either transforming as a vector, right? Or as a spinner and a singlet. Yeah, there are lots of uh, representations that you can construct. So we have to fix the representation of psi. Right? That is something that the theory gives you. And then you have to see whether you can consistently couple it to the background, to the gauge fields, okay, so that this property is satisfied. So we are using the M matrix. Yeah, in this case, we are assuming the psi transformation as some M dimensional representation. right? That M dimensional representation could be reducible or irreducible. We have not said anything about whether it's irreducible representation or irreducible representation. And it could, for example, break up into a sum of irreducible representation. Okay, so array of size is a representation matrix, but it need not be irreducible. Is that clear? You remember the refinement of irreducible and irreducible representation? Okay, you have to remember your group theory. Right? That if, if the matrix Basically, if you can block diagonalize, right? For every group element, if you can uh, write the matrix, you can see the basis in which the matrix becomes block diagonalized. Then it's reducible, right? Otherwise, it's uh, irreducible. Okay, so let's try to prove this. So the first thing I'll do is to use this definition of S mu to write d mu psi. as del mu psi minus i re of s mu psi. <coughs> is this clear? re of s mu x is a perfectly well defined object, right? Because for every x, s mu x is a place of matrix, right? Because it's a linear combination of these. B mu A T A. So array of that is perfectly well defined, and the way you go from here to there is by using the linearity property of the representation. Okay? That this is a linear combination of the T S that is inside, okay? but the B mu A of X, which are the coefficients, you can always take outside. So that's the relation we derived in the first case. So now let's try to calculate D mu prime of psi prime. So this is del mu psi prime minus i r e of s mu prime of x psi prime.
Now, psi time, of course, we know what it is. Psi time is R of u. S mu prime. You remember the formula for S mu prime? Let me write this minus i del mu u u inverse plus u s mu u inverse. Okay, that is the formula for s mu prime that we are derived. Okay, from this we also worked out the formula for how v mu transforms, like v mu prime, and there we had this alpha mu a and r a b coefficients. Okay, but uh, uh, I'll work with this. Okay, it's much simpler to work with the matrix notation than the component notation. So this then I can write as del mu of u psi, <coughs> u of x i of x, minus i r a of I. minus del mu of r a r a, del mu yeah, it's, you have to basically put this s mu prime, is there a, something? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Then you are R of. Keep forgetting the R. So, minus I R A of this object. Minus I, then you do U inverse plus U S U inverse. And now I'm using, going to use the two relations that we had derived. Okay. So first of all, RA of this plus this is RA of this plus RA of this. That's my linearity problem, right? RA of sum of generators is the sum of the RAs. So RA of this and RA of this, but we have derived formulas for RA of this, okay? And RA of this, so that's, so let me write the first line. So this is del mu of R of u times psi x plus r of u times del mu of psi x. Here you have minus i times r a of this, that's minus i del mu r of u times r of u inverse. So there is a psi prime, they forgot. Psi prime is again u of r, r of u of x. Then r a of the second term is r of u, r a of s mu, r of u inverse. And then r of u of x. Is this clear what we have done? Right? I just took this array of this plus array of this, and I use the formula that we already derived. Array of minus i del mu inverse is minus i del mu r u times r of u inverse. Okay, maybe we didn't have the minus sign, but that's of course can be taken out on both sides by linearity. And then r of u array of u s mu inverse is just r of u array of s mu array of u inverse. This is again the first identity that you took. And then you have R of U of X times I of X. So now basically we are more or less done, right? We just have to cancel the two terms. So I can write this as del mu R of u, R of, of psi, 
plus power of u del mu psi. Now let's look at this term. The minus i times minus i gives you minus one, and this r of u inverse cancels this r of u. Is here. So this becomes minus del mu r of u times i. And this term becomes minus i minus i r of u times r of s. <coughs> so these cancel, and what you are left with is r of u. Times del mu psi minus i r a of s u psi, but this is of course by definition our del mu psi. Okay, so this shows that indeed del mu psi or del mu psi transforms covariant. Have any more freedom actually? Once you have fixed the representation, right? R a is defined for every matrix, right? So S mu of course is B mu A T A, right? So there is no freedom in defining what D mu psi is, right? Once you have fixed the representation, that's it. The D mu psi is part uh, completely defined. Is that? Yeah. So the representation determines what D mu psi is. Right? There's nothing that you can do to change it. So, if we define the same D mu with the n different n by matrices, that yes. is like S U M. S U M, yes. So See, for S U M, you have to introduce first of all n square minus one gauge fields. Yes. Right. Yes. So those gauge fields, we have nothing to do with, with the, the n square minus one gauge field that we have used. Right. So you first fix your gauge group. Right, which in this case you have taken to be S U N. Then you fix your its representation. What representation uh, it transforms in the field transforms in, okay. and that basically fixes that uh, definition of the new side. Right, number of gauge fields is the number of generators of the original gauge group. Right, that you are not going to change. So if it is an S U N gauge group that you are dealing with, the n square minus one gauge fields, and that you have fixed that from the beginning. Right, but that does not mean that. All fields have to transform in the n by n dimensional representation, right? Even though we used the defining representation, this fundamental representation to introduce the gauge fields. Okay, later on we will see that that's why not so not necessary. Okay, but the way we have introduced the gauge field is by we gave a special role to the TAs, right? As compared to R of TAs, R of TAs, right? Because we define the gauge fields initially in terms of the TAs. But if you once you have defined it. You really don't have any further freedom for a given representation, right? This is the only way you can define your covariant derivative. Is this clear? Okay, and this is to be distinguished from starting with an m-dimensional representation and making u m into a gauge. Okay, that will introduce different kinds of gauge fields. Okay. Now it should be clear that once we have the covariant derivative, we can easily write down gauge invariant action. Right? So, for example, for fermions, we have something like psi bar i gamma mu d mu minus m psi. This is gauge invariant. Right? Because 
psi bar psi of course is gauge invariant, u of x, u of x dagger cancel. d mu psi goes to u times d mu psi, right? and that will cancel with u dagger that comes from a transformation of psi bar. Okay, so this is gauge invariant. Please perform the For scalars, we can write down similar term d mu phi dagger d mu phi plus m square phi dagger phi. the kinetic term and the mass terms are standard. Okay, once we have uh, gauged it, the kinetic term is just replaced, uh, obtained by the free kinetic term, okay, with d mu, del mu replaced by d mu, okay, both for the for and the scalars. But we may want to introduce also more couplings. Right? I mean, what we want to see is that once you have fixed a symmetric, and maybe I put a few more constraints, what is the most general action that you can write down? Okay, which is still consistent with the symmetry. Okay? Now, of course, the most general action will have infinite number of terms. Okay, but later on we will see that we want to restrict the total number of uh, terms by demanding that the action has that. The, each term has dimension uh, 4 or less. Okay. But let's not worry about the most general set of terms. Okay. We want to see what is the general rule for writing down possible terms in the action. Okay. Later on, we will see whether all of them we should write or we restrict to some of them. Okay. But what are the general rules? Okay. So let's take a simple example. Suppose you have three, set, three scalar fields. Okay. Three scalar fields transforming in different representations of this group. We have a SUN gauge group. We have a scalar field phi 1 transforming in, say, a representation R1. A scalar field phi 2 transforming in a representation R2. And a scalar field phi 3 transforming in a representation R3. What kind of coupling can we write down? Okay. Say, suppose you want to write down a cubic coupling between these three scalars. Okay. Is that always possible? Okay. Or can you just write down arbitrary coupling? Now it should be clear that if we just write an arbitrary coupling, okay, then it's not going to be gauge invariant. Right? It's not going to be invariant under you know, phi goes to u, u phi symmetry. So you have to make some restriction. And so what I will do is to elaborate this okay, in the context of SU2 gauge fields, where you understand the representation so well. Right? So suppose you have an SU2 gauge symmetry. Okay, this SU2 has nothing to do with the, the usual rotation group. Okay, it's some uh, gauge group that you have in the theory. Okay. And you want to see that if we have three different representations of the SU2, okay, three different scalar fields transforming in three different representations of SU2, how can we construct gauge invariant uh, terms in the action? Is this question clear? Okay. So take example. SU2 gauge term. Now we were taking these, all the fields that were there, mm -hmm. that were transforming as a, uh, as a column vector together, right? And but it could be irreducible column vector, irreducible mm -hmm. representation, yes. right? In which case you can think of that each field transforming individually as under uh, this column yes. vectors, okay. right? It need not be that all the fields transform under one mm -hmm. single column. Oh, you can always write it as one single column vector, right? Yes, because given all these fields, you can always put them in a big yes. column, right? But usually it's useful to think in terms of irreducible representation 
right? You think of these are different fields, each transforming in some area to some representation. Okay, but if you want, you can always put it in a big column like this. Okay, it just makes things a little uh, more hidden if you try to do that. Okay, so SU2 representations okay, are labeled by what? Yes, the J, right? J has something to do with angular momentum again, right? But uh, SU2 is a, as a group, okay, is the same, right? So its representation will be labeled by J, okay? So suppose that we have the three fields, I1, okay? this is in spin J1, J1 representation. We have phi2 in spin J2 representation and phi3 in spin J2 representation. So then phi1 will carry how many components? 2j1 plus 1, right? And we will label them by the standard phi1 m1 okay. where m1 runs from minus j1 to minus j1 so m1 takes value minus j1 minus j1 plus 1 up to j1 okay. and similarly phi2 m2 and phi3 m3 okay. And now suppose that you want to write a qubit coupling involving phi1, phi2, and phi3, okay? Which means that we want a vortex like this, okay? One end is phi1, okay? You of course carry this index m1, and then index phi2, and then index phi3. Okay, we want a vortex like this, okay? For whatever reason, maybe experiments have found vortices of this kind, okay? And you want to write down a qubit coupling. So the most general qubit coupling that you can write down is like this. We are summing over m1, m2, m3. Okay, this we are still using some of the convention. Okay, summing over m1, m2, m3. But of course, in general, this is not gauge invariant. Okay. So let us see what it becomes under gauge transformation. So this under gauge transformation, under gauge transformation, okay, will become k m1, m2, m3, r j1. M1, M1 prime, Rj2, M2, M2 prime, Rj2, M3, M3 prime of phi J1, M1 prime, phi J2, M2 prime, phi J3. Called them phi one, phi two, phi three, right? So phi one plus phi two, phi three. So okay, but so far all that I have done, I have not used this to that it's a SU two representation anywhere, right? So it's a, it could be done for any group. Okay, you can think of this as some representation levels. Okay, and you have you know, some arbitrary group. But what do you want this to be? 
Right? You want this to be the same as the original. Right? That's what I mean is, is the meaning of the action being invariant. Right? We want this to be invariant, so you want this to be equal to need. You need this to be equal to k m1 can m2 can m3 can phi1 m1 can phi2 m2 can phi3 So this puts restriction on what k we can choose. Okay. So this means this requires that k m1 prime, m2 prime, m3 prime should be equal to k m1, m2, m3 or j1. I forgot that u in this u argument, so I did not put this in the u. Is this clear? So this looks like an infinite number of constraints because every u has to satisfy this, right? But we can determine the independent constraints by just looking at infinitesimal u's. Okay, because once you ensure that it's true, this invariance is true for infinitesimal group elements. Okay, then you can build finite group element by successive application of infinitesimal group element. Okay. So what you can do is we just take u to be 1 minus i epsilon omega i t a and expand it out. Okay. And that way you get constraints on t, independent constraints. Okay. So there will be n square minus 1 independent constraints on this coefficient scale. Right? Because for every generator we have to have, we have to satisfy this. Um, I did you declare that u argument u is same. Because we are making the transformation by some u, right? The whole field configuration, all the fields we transform by the same u, right? Okay, it's not outer product of. Um, it's a, a single transformation. Yeah, because otherwise, even demu psi, when you use the fact that you demu psi is covariant, right? If we had used uh, transform psi and the gauge fields by different u's, then of course there is no hope of. Uh, getting gauge invariance, right? So when I say the gauge group is SUN, that means there is a single u, okay? Once u is fixed, u as a function of x, all fields transform by the same u, right? Only then it's a uh, symmetry of the action, okay? So that's why here each of these files must transform by the same u, okay? Otherwise, their kinetic terms will not be gauge invariant, right? Because there's only one set of gauge fields which transform by some u, right? So unless all the files use the same u, there is no hope, to, hope of even making the kinetic terms gauge invariant. Is this clear? Representations are different. Sorry? Like R, J1 and J2, J3 can be different. Can be different, yes. Exactly. But U is the same. Right? You pick U of X. The matrices, of course, will be different. Right? But they will all be determined by the original matrix U that you have chosen. So this basically gives constraints on things. So only those k's are allowed which satisfy this condition. And this you can of course repeat for uh, uh, higher order couplings also, right? I have token qubit coupling, but there is no use to, I mean the same analysis can be repeated for higher order couplings. And as I said, already that whatever I have done so far, okay, there is no mention of SU2 anywhere, right? You could have done it for any SUN group. Okay, the M1 will just run over all the uh, 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 indices of that particular representation. 
So they are more empty. So uh, from here actually, if we take J1, J2, and J3 to be same, then can we determine that all the k have to be same value? All? Uh, if I take all the representations to be same, yes. So then from here I should determine that all the coupling strains are same. No. We cannot. Do that. Yeah, I mean that's wrong. The wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> but we will see why. Why not? Okay. Why that's the wrong answer? Okay. Yeah, because we'll relate these two. Uh, I mean something which you already know. Okay. So let's now focus on SU two. Okay, and see for SU two whether you can do something better. Okay, whether you can do something more explicit. Sir, there is there is no summation in M one. Yes, yes, everything is sum over. Okay. There is some summation because this this is a summation over M one M two M three. Right. So these are M1 prime, M2 prime, M3 prime. These are summed over, right? Because they're repeated indices. So what I did is I just compared this I1 M prime, phi 2 M prime, phi 3 M prime coefficients on both sides, right? Because these are independent fields. So it's true that here there is summation, okay? But because they are independent fields, right? Individual coefficients can be compared. So K M and K is okay. It's not a matrix. It has three index, right? So you can write it as a cube, but some rectangular kind of object, right? So, but I mean, when you go to higher dimensions, it could be even higher dimensional objects, right? K is just something that has three index, right? So the total number of uh, uh, independent, total number of components of K is just the product of the dimension of this times dimension of this times dimension of this, right? That those those will be independent Ks to begin with, right? And then we try to determine the the constraints, right, which tells us that not all of the cases can be independent. Is that point here? Okay, so K, you just think of this as a multi-index object. Okay, if you want, you just sum over, write the sum over M1, M2, M3. Okay, and M1 prime, M2 prime, M3. Okay. Nevertheless, the reason that you can compare these coefficients it's because these are all independent fields. I have a question. Yes. 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 So, so, uh, so here there is this field, scalar field phi. Mm -hmm. Suppose I take another uh, scalar field, say phi tilde, mm -hmm. which is transforming under some different uh, gauge group. And different gauge group. Some yes. different gauge group. And it will have its own gauge fields and all. Mm -hmm. Now the point is that suppose the, I just want to say that if I want to uh, write down a coupling involving phi and phi tildes, so if I do the same thing as we have done here, mm -hmm. so I, I write a general k which will uh, have phi and phi tildes, mm -hmm. then that will again amount to putting some constraints on k, and then can I show that that k vanishes altogether? So which will well, I mean sometimes you may be able to show if these are okay, I mean. When you say that the, it transforms on a different gauge group, right? Mm -hmm. You test gauge group by gauge group. Yeah. Okay. And then each gauge group has to be invariant. Yeah. Okay? Yes. So suppose you say that phi one transforms under one gauge group. Yes. Phi two transforms under some other gauge group. Yes. That means under the original gauge group, phi two is a singlet. It doesn't transform. Okay. So that's R of you. So R of you that you have to put in there mm -hmm. is the identity matrix. Okay. 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 So you will check this relation. Mm -hmm. Okay. With R replaced by identity matrix. Right. Right. Okay. Right. If you can satisfy this relation. Then the coupling doesn't vanish. Okay. If you cannot, then the coupling will vanish. Right. So you have to think of. I mean, I have not introduced so far more than one gauge group. Mm -hmm. Right. But we'll uh, do this maybe next time. But the general uh, philosophy is that for each gauge group, you have to make sure that it's invariant. Right. Okay. So two different gauge group gauge groups are different transformations. Right. right? So you don't have to mix them up. Mm -hmm. Right. You keep the first transformation to be identity, mm -hmm. as you are making this transformation in the second gauge group. For example. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you always use R that you are using for one gauge group at a time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. Uh, but what I wish to say was like, uh, I can do the same thing with some other uh, scalar, say phi with different uh, phi tilde with different gauge group. So it's like two different actions. I'm just uh, suppose action of phi and action of phi tilde. So S was. Uh, S of phi was invariant under its own gauge transformation. Yeah. S of phi. See, S of phi doesn't probably make sense because yes. S refers to the gauge transformation, gauge group. Yes. Right? Yes. Phi is a scalar field or a Fermion field, mm -hmm. okay, which, which transforms under the gauge field, mm -hmm. gauge group. It may transform under it, it may transform as a singular representation of the gauge group, which means it doesn't transform. Mm -hmm. 
There will be five which transform under both gate groups. Right, right. Right? Mm -hmm. So each five mm -hmm. carries one index for every gate group. Okay. okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Now it may happen that some of those index is trivial, that it, it, it just doesn't carry a gate group. Right. It carries a representation. That means it transform it's transforming as a single. Under, under that. Okay. But this is completely general. Mm -hmm. Right? If some of these are singlets, mm -hmm. okay, you will just have a corresponding M2. Okay. Okay. Takes only one value. Yes. Right? And we will uh, still couple. Okay. If you can satisfy this, okay, by with this replaced by identity, yes. that's still an unout coupling. Yes. Okay, so you have to determine under what condition you can do that. Okay, so now you can. So you want to see how that there is a, uh, I mean, uh, systematic procedure for constructing this case. Okay, rather than solving it. Okay, and I'll tell you for ACU two how you can go about doing that. Okay, but for this you have to just reinterpret this problem in a slightly different way. Right? What are you trying to get? We are saying that this should be invariant. Right? Now something which is invariant means that it transforms as a singlet of ACU two. Right? Singlet of SU2, singlet representation, you know, k equal to 0 representation, right? That's what is called singlet. k equal to 0 representation is obviously invariant. Right? <coughs> so, what you want is that you want to combine representations carrying labels j1, j2, and j3 okay, together to make a j equal to 0 representation. Is that clear? Yes. Well, total J should vanish is a little uh, uh, strange uh, notion for quantum mechanics. Right? So you have to <laughs> we have to see what it means total J vanishing, right? But so what are what so the, the point is I mean what you can do here is that you can do it in steps. Okay. So imagine that you first combine phi two and phi three. Okay. You have product of phi two m two phi three m three. So that transforms out as some representation of SU2, right? It's given by this matrix RJ2 M2 M2 prime, RJ3 M2 M3 prime on phi 2 phi 3, right? This is a representation, it's here, right? It's just carrying two levels, two indices. Okay. So this representation, it can be decomposed into irreducible representations of SU2, right? What irreducible representation can it have? So, J1 minus J, mod J1 minus J2 to mod J1 plus J2, right? So, this product, right? Well, in this case, I am combining 2 and 3. So, mod J2 minus J3 to mod J2 plus J3. Okay, the J that you can get by combining, so you take a product of these two. So, this is a product matrix. Okay, it, you decompose into irreducible representations of SO. In that process, you can get representations from mod J2 minus J3 to mod J2 plus J3. Suppose you want representation J. How will you get it? What linear combination of this product you have to take to get representation J? You have taken phi 2 of M2 times phi 3 of M3. M2 M3 runs over 2J1 plus 1 times 2J2 plus, sorry, 2J3, J2 plus 1 times 2J3 plus 1 values, right? Okay. That number, 2J2 plus 1 times 2J3 plus 1, is the same as the number of 2 mod J2 minus J3 plus 1 plus 2 mod J2 minus J3 plus 1 plus 1 and so on. Okay, it just basically goes from over all possible uh, values. Okay, we have mod J2, right? J2, okay. So this number, 2J2 plus 1 times 2J3 plus 1, is the sum of these numbers. That calculation you have done, right? Because you are just representing original uh, set of variables into a linear combination of this irreducible representation. Now, I want to know that I am not interested in all the representations. Okay. I want to pick a particular J. Let's pick a particular J. Okay. 
how many linear in, linearly independent terms will be there for that particular g? How many linearly independent combinations will transform in a given uh, representation g? 2j plus 1, right? Because there are 2j plus 1 components for g, right? So it will be labeled by Jm. Okay, J is fixed, J is something that I am computing. Okay. And there should be an index M where M runs from M goes from minus J minus J plus 1 to J. So this means what? This means that there exists. There exists there exist coefficients that we call it L J such that You have taken this product. Okay. Here there are 2j2 plus 1 times 2 j3 plus 1 independent elements. Okay. Now we want to take 2j plus 1 linearly independent uh, linear combinations of this product, okay. which will have the property that they transform in the spin j representation. Is this question? Yeah. So what I'm saying here is that. So what is the problem that we are trying to address here? That we have these fields. Okay. This transforms in spin J1 representation. Okay. With 2J1 plus 1, co sorry, 2J2 plus 1 coefficient. This transforms in a spin J3 representation with 2J3 plus 1 co uh, uh, coefficient. Right? Take the product. Altogether, we have 2J2 plus 1 times 2J3 plus 1 independent products. Okay. Now we want to take linear combinations of these, okay. such that the 2j plus 2j of plus 1 linear combinations transform as the spin j representation. Okay? So there must exist something like this as long as j is between mod j2 minus j3 to mod j2 plus j3. So how do we determine this? What are these coefficients? Yes. Yes, using raising learning operator, but these are names. Yeah. These are the case gotten coefficients, right? So this subject, right, you can look from the table, right? C J1, J J J1, J2, M M1, M2. Is this clear? So you take these linear combinations, okay, and if you take J to run over this whole range, you would have gotten all possible combinations of this product. Okay? Because total number is the same, right? You are just reorganizing this product in by taking appropriate linear combinations. Okay, but why did we do this? Okay, we did this because ultimately what are you interested in? What you are interested in is to construct a singlet. Okay, a spin zero representation. Okay. But we have one more phi, the phi one. Right? Phi one of M1. Okay, M1 running from goes from minus J1, minus J1 plus one up to J1. So how can we combine this with these linear combinations? Let's say like phi. Of 
then to pi t of x. Okay, so we have these. Okay, the same number as we started with, just organized in a slightly different way. Okay. And you have these. We don't want to take a product and take linear combinations, the appropriate linear combinations of the form. I have used up n, so let's say n m. Sorry, this should be j two j three. J two j three. N m one m. Then c j j two j three m. Then two m three. Pi j pi two. M two pi three m two. Okay, this is already here times pi one m one. Pi one m one, and we are looking for some coefficient n m one m. Is this here? Right. So this projected into the spin j representation. Right. M running from minus j to plus j. Okay, we have not lost anything because by the time we run j through all of these, okay. and for each run m from minus to j, minus j to plus j, we have got all the linear combinations that we had to begin with. Okay, just pi to m two times pi to m. Now we want to take the product of this and get something which is invariant and resolute, which means we have to get something which has spin zero. How do we get it? What is the coefficient that we have to multiply this by? This n m one m is what we are after. Yes. Minus j. See, minus j of course j is always positive, right? So we basically have to repeat the same logic that we. Did earlier, right? Earlier you are combining J1 and J2 and J3 to combine get spin J. Now you are combining J and J1 to get spin zero, right? <laughs> so this object should be the Gauss Gordon coefficient C zero. J1 is part J1 J zero M1 M. Zero M1. M, right? M one and M. So this is the product. That this is our k. Okay. So k that we are looking for. <coughs> okay. Here J is summed over. But what values can J take? J two minus J three to J two. Yes, here it can. What about here? J minus J two. J minus J three. This is already zero. So J is one. M goes from minus J to plus J. See, J is the angular momentum level, right? It's positive. Okay. If you want to combine J one and J two, get a single. It has to be J one, right? So you cannot get a singlet by combining any uh, other angular momentum than J one because if we combine J one and J, right, it will go from mod J minus J one to mod J plus J one, right? To get a zero, you better have J equal to J one, right? So even though there is a sum over here, J in this case is fixed to be J one, right? So then the coefficient that we are looking for, K, M one, M two, M three. In this case, is given by C zero J J zero M M one sorry zero M one M times C J J two J three sorry zero J one J one J is equal to J one so J one J one J is J one M
So you see, you have said all the k's to be equal, right? It certainly wouldn't work, right? I mean, you have to satisfy this condition. I mean, it should be non-zero only when m1 plus m2 plus m3 equal to zero. No, no. I was saying that if j1, j2, j3 means all the fields are in same representation. Yes. So j1 j equal to j2 equal to j3. They all are the same. Okay. Yeah. Right? Then Even then, this condition has to be satisfied. Right? <laughs> yes, so you yes. have just said all the coefficients to be equal. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it is basically determined by the k1 coefficient. In this case, there is a unique way to do this, right? So the k that you get is unique. This is not always the case, right? For four-point coupling, for example, that if you have j1, j2, j3, j4, right? You may get uh, different ways of combining j1, j2, j3, j4 into a singlet, right? You first combine j1 and j2, then you combine it with j3, then you combine it with j4, right? Eventually, you have to get a singlet, but you have then one more claims one coefficient coming in here. But the general principle should be clear, right? I mean, the way you can construct, at least for SU2, the way you can construct singles is by you keep combining products, okay? Project them into some irreducible representation, then combine with the next one, project into irreducible representation, and so on. Okay? And for higher groups, you basically have to use the claves gordon coefficients for the uh, higher groups, okay? For SUN. The analog of the claves gordon coefficients also exist for SUN, okay? Although they are, of course, much more complicated. Okay? But the general Principle is the same. Okay? That you take two representations of SUN. Okay? If you take a product okay, of two fields in the two representation, it transforms in general in a reducible representation. Okay? So claves gordon coefficients tell you how to take linear combinations of the product to make it into irreducible representation. Okay? So if we have say four different representations, R1, R2, R3, R4. Okay, what we will do is we will first take a product of R1 and R2. Okay, you can start from any direction, it doesn't matter. Take a product of R1 and R2. Then decompose into a set of irreducible representations. Okay, then take product of each of them with R3. Again decompose into irreducible representations. And finally take a product with R4. Okay, when you take a product with R4, then you have to get a singlet. Okay, and that basically fixes the uh, coefficients. Okay, if there are more than one way of doing it, Okay, then you have more than one way of uh, uh, having the coupling. Okay. And that basically means that I should have said here that this should be some constant beta times this. Right? You can always multiply the action by constant without uh, destroy the symmetric properties. So for every invariant way of getting to a singlet, okay, to a gauge invariant uh, form, you have a different constant in that. So all of those are parameters that you have you can introduce into the action. Okay. So the general philosophy then is that for every possible gauge invariant term that you can write down, okay, and those terms you get by combining using Clef's Gordon, okay, you have a coefficient that is arbitrary. Okay, and that's how you construct the general action consists with some gauge principles. Yes. Yes, we have, of course, this sort of interaction. Okay, in standard model, you have not exactly cubic coupling between the pies, okay? but you have, for example, the coupling, cubic coupling between two formulas and the, and the scalar. Right? That the principle is the same there. 
right? You construct the coupling between here. I use two three scalars, right? But as far as the group theory is concerned, it's the same principle which which will work for two Fermi one side scalars. Is this okay? Okay, so maybe we'll continue about.